Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for Charter School Capital's webinar series. Today is the comparison guide for California deferral financing options. Um, we will get started in a few minutes, right around 10 o'clock. We're waiting for other people to join. We'll be back shortly.
Hey, good morning, everybody, again. Um, just wanted to let you know, we're gonna get started momentarily here. We're just waiting a couple more minutes for more people to join. Uh, we'll get started uh, a couple minutes from now. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. We're gonna get started. Welcome to today's uh, Charter School Capital Webinar Series. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the comparison guide at California Deferral Financing Options. Um, obviously, right now, during this time, there's a lot of schools preparing for the unknown, and uh, we thought it would be pertinent to discuss uh, different financing options, since a lot of schools are looking to handle the deferrals and other options out there. I hope you're all safe and well. Uh, as we get started, uh, I'll put up here a quick uh, agenda and um, we can discuss the panel that I'll introduce you today. I got a couple guest speakers and glad to have them. Uh, we'll look through the California funding challenge that we're all faced with at this time. Uh, then we'll cover some financing solutions and then factors to consider when you are analyzing those financing solutions. Uh, we'll run a comparison to different options, just making sure that uh, everybody's aware of the pros and cons of each solution. And then we'll open it up to questions at the end. Uh, feel free, you can use the uh, chat function on the side to uh, put your questions in during the the process, if you have any along the way, uh, we'll try to tackle those at the very end. Um, I'll get started with today's panel. Myself, first off, uh, I'm Ryan Eldridge. I'm a senior new business manager with Charter School Capital. Been with the company for over seven years now. And, uh, you know, I'm a father of three. I coach sports. I, you know, volunteer on uh, nonprofit boards as well. I really got started in the charter school space uh, because of my three children going to different schools at different times. 
and uh, started to really analyze the uh, the choices that parents and students had out there uh, as they progressed through their education. And uh, I was fortunate enough to come across Charter School Capital, who's now served over 700 charter schools nationally, uh, <clears throat> serving about 1.25 million students during that time and about $2 billion in the industry currently. Um, the idea being is that we can provide the resources that charter schools need to be able to fulfill their missions in the communities they serve. Uh, during my time, I've been able and fortunate enough to work with a couple of the guest speakers that are here today and um, with at some point or another with the different clients at one time. Uh, first off, Paul Corey from Delta Managed Solutions and Corey Kavanaugh for Creative Back Office. Uh, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you to do a quick introduction as well. Thank you, Ryan. I'm glad to be here. Uh, unlike you, I don't coach sports. I don't have kids in school. I live and breathe accounting and finance. Uh, I've been in finance for 30 years. Last 10 years, I've been dealing with uh, charter schools. I joined DMS in October of 2018. Uh, we serve 55 plus schools in the state of California and into Nevada. Um, and I am very happy to be joining this webinar today. And Corey? Thanks. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, and Ryan, thank you for uh, for inviting me to be on here. I'm happy to be here this morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Corey Kavanaugh. I'm the president and founder of Creative Back Office. I've been doing um, charter school consulting and back office services for just about 12 years now. Um, and during that time, I've gotten to work with um, approximately 55 schools or so, um, ranging from, you know, as small as you know, startup schools that are in the, you know, below 100 to, you know, conglomerate organizations that are above, you know, four or 5,000 students. So, um, and anything from independent study virtual to traditional site-based schools. So, um, that's a little bit about me and, and my experience as well. Well, great. Well, I'm very happy to have you both on here. Thanks again for joining. So, why are we here today? Well, um, as we look at this, uh, this slide in particular, it's official, right? It's a recession. Um, I think we were given that official notification on June 8th of 2020. By that time, I think a lot of us already realized that was the case. And, you know, I think it's it's timely, obviously, to uh, understand kind of what the impact of where we are today and where this where this might be going. And so in order to do that, you know, we kind of look back at some of the uh, couple different charts here that I have, one of them being uh, showing the, you know, the economy as it will, you know, in previous recessions and kind of where the dips occur, you know, between total taxes, individual income taxes. And, um, you know, for the most part, we're looking at the graphs that you can see where the recessions kind of started. 2000, 2001 range, the dips really occur a little bit further downstream. Same thing occurred in 2007, eight, actually when we kind of, our companies got started, uh, the dips really occur, you know, a little further downstream. And then the chart next to it is showing kind of what that impact had on there during the last recession when it came to deferrals. So as you can see in 2009 or 10 is when they really started to occur, but then they started to increase over time. So, you know, when you when you look at this, uh, you know, Paul, just out of curiosity, what, what what is your feel for where we are today, and you know, looking at this, and the, as you look forward. So, interesting because when I joined the, this space, I uh, it was the 2009 recession, so I was hit with all those the budget cuts and then the deferrals uh, in my first few years of working with charters. Uh, what I find today is, uh, yes, we are we are in a recession and there are difficulties. And on top of that, this year there's a lot of CARES Act one-time funding aimed to help these schools. But I just see a, a large period of uncertainty ahead. Um, and I think this is a really important thing to keep in mind is the school's budget and think about what their cash needs are going to be. Um, we are you know, telling clients that we are as concerned about 21-22 from more so than we are about the current year given the runtime funding so but it is uncertain and Corey what about you 
Yeah, I think one of the things to really sort of notice there is if you if we consider ourselves sort of in the, the peak of the recession right now, and if you go back to previous recessions, if you look at, you know, sort of the bar chart there of 07 through 09, um, you kind of see deferrals were, you know, at a minimum, you know, really sort of the lowest they were. And then if you look at those next three fiscal years, beginning with 09, 010, through the next three years, you can kind of see where as the rest of the economy is sort of crawling its way or, or, you know, out of the recession, that's really when the deferrals really sort of hit their peak for, for schools in the state of California. And so that's one of the things I think if we acknowledge today that we are at the height or, you know, the, the peak of, of the recession and the economy as a whole is at its lowest, um, the effect on charter schools and, you know, the state of California budget really doesn't really take an impact until a fiscal year or two or even three down the road, and you can kind of see that again. If you just sort of highlight that 07, 08, which is you know everyone sort of acknowledges was that peak of the Great Recession and the financial crisis, um, but really there were no deferrals in 07, 08, and then 08, 09 they start, um, but then you can really see how they spike over the next three fiscal years. And so I think that's one thing is if you look at the landscape today versus where we're going, I think um, that chart on the right there is something to really take note of. All right. Yeah, so I, you know, obviously, what I'm hearing is, is yes, we're in a recession. Yes, we have uh, upcoming issues, but and you know, we'll cover this kind of here on the current state of affairs. Um, but it sounds like the bigger concern is potentially further down the road, more so than just today, right? Yeah, agreed. Okay. So with the California funding challenge that we're facing today, I know a lot of schools, everybody's in a different stage. You know, we have different charters up and down California, well over a thousand charters. You know, we've got we've got smaller mom and pop shops, large CMOs. We've got schools that just started this current year to schools that have been renewed several times. Uh, some that have a hundred kids, some have thousands of children. So with that in mind, everybody's got to look through their own lens as we go through this presentation. The idea is just to make sure that we understand what's the best options for the schools. But with the current state of affairs, we do, do know that 36% of the L, LCFF payments are gonna be deferred this year, right? Um, the ongoing deferral you know, of June is, is gonna be ongoing. Uh, we don't know potential changes on payment schedules of deferrals. We don't know if there could be more budget cuts or more deferrals down the road, but for now we know what's, what's happening in the current school year. Site-based schools, fortunately, are going to be paid on growth. Now, that's determined by the lesser of the two, of course, of their 630 budget projections of the 107 student counts. Uh, Non-classroom-based schools, of course, are excluded from the growth, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, there could be additional challenges, potential costs related to COVID, things that schools have to prepare for as they try to open their doors and actually serve students. But with that said, um, where do you, you, Corey, I'll go to you first here on this one. Where do you feel a lot of your schools are? I mean, are, are the schools really having a lot of issues right now currently, or are they doing okay financially? Um, yeah, so a couple points there, Ryan, and I don't want to go, you can stay on this slide, but I just want to touch upon that is, you know, as current, let's just say today, um, you know, October here, you know, a school hasn't had a deferral yet. Um, you know, outside of, I know June um, of last year was deferred, but just, you know, a couple of weeks ago. So really that impact hasn't happened. And so if you think about the deferrals, we're gonna be almost say a year into COVID-19, um, you know, when we get to February 21, where we see our first sort of major deferral happen. And so if you kind of look at, it's not until a year that we see our first deferral. Um, and so as of today, from a, from a cash flow standpoint, you know, charter schools and, are largely unaffected, at least from what I'm seeing. Um, Another thing to point out too, and Paul mentioned this, was with all that one-time funding with, um, I'll just lump them all into the CARES Act, coronavirus, um, you know, all those funds that I'm sure, you know, some of the people on this panel, or uh, excuse me, attending have, have you know, heard about. Um, I have a lot of my schools that are actually receiving more money currently this fiscal year than projected for last year. And so I think just to touch on current as of today, I, I know what the spring is gonna look like and, and we're gonna have some challenges there, but as, as Paul sort of mentioned, um, you know, next year, 21, 22, 22, 23 is where, you know, we might really see a cut because if we go back to the, um, you know, the adopted budget this year, we were projecting that 10% cut um, and that didn't happen. And so I think that's one thing to touch upon as bad as these deferrals may seem here, 
um, you know, unfortunately, it might be getting getting worse. And I'll 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 let Paul, you know, chime in as well. Thank you, Corey. You know, um, I am more concerned about 2122. We don't know the political climate, right? We have an election coming up. Uh, the feds are the ones who bail the states out and states have to balance budgets. So if this recession lingers uh, and you get to, uh, lots of bickering at the federal level, we don't know what that state outlook looks like. Um, I have a lot of schools that have an adequate reserve at the moment, but uh, based on past history, in my, the four years after that general recession, we know that reserve can go away quickly if you're not careful. And with one-time funding, the other thing I, I tell clients is, Keep in mind you have an operating budget and you have to separate out those one-time funds there for specific needs to deal with this year. And when you get through that, you still need an operating budget that in the future is, provides a long-term viable financial platform for you to continue and keep your doors open. Um, and if there are further deferrals or cuts uh, after getting through this year, that creates issues. Yeah, and I think that's an important point too, is that these one-time funds aren't guaranteed long-term, so you can't really in include them in the recurring uh, revenues. So, um, well, obviously during this situation, there's a lot of schools again in different stages. Some may need money today. Some are fine for cash right now, have heavy cash reserves, and are really just kind of looking forward to the deferrals. Potentially, that is an option of how to finance or manage uh, the shortfalls in the cash there. Um, other schools are fine all the way through deferrals and actually may even be for, yeah, fine past that. And they're actually starting to look further into the fiscal 22 because they don't know if they want to deplete all the cash reserves or, you know, finance portions of it and maintain some cash reserves. But whatever state you're in, the reality is, is that there's different financing solutions out there. Um, CSFA, you know, different groups out there have actually indicated that during these times that schools are going to have to probably find their own resources for cash support. And with that, um, you know, there's some options out there. So as we kind of look through and we skip forward to some different financing solutions, I'll start with, you know, term loans. Um, term loans obviously could be one, two, three, possibly even further type terms. Um, you know, it's a specific amount of money agreed upon up front, you know, and you can make it either a fixed rate or some kind of floating rate uh, situated for that. Oftentimes we find, and I don't know if you guys agree with this, like the term loans are often pretty common uh, when it comes to tenant improvements on a facility or some large purchase that a school has to make that they'll utilize a term loan uh, more significantly than more so than maybe for cash purposes. Is that, is that what you find out there as well? Yeah, pretty much. Term loans uh, are very specific in nature uh, and not readily used for cash flow issues for for charters, certainly. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And just to touch, a lot of times with these banks, they want to tie um, a loan, like a, like a sort of a term loan to an asset, you know, building tenant improvements. Um, you know, a lot of the commercial banks aren't familiar with, you know, state, ADA revenue. So a lot of times they like to tie it to something more tangible that they're familiar with building leases, um, you know, tenant improvements, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to, you know, preface this with the idea that these are all different vehicles, right? But different solutions, different options that schools should look at. And they should look at all of them, in my opinion. Um, you know, compare cost rates, everything else. We'll get into that a little bit further. Um, another one that seems to be pretty common right now and popular um, is a RAN or a TRAN. Um, CSFA put out a great program. They have some really competitive low interest rates uh, that they floated out there. I think a lot of people probably even on this call have actually looked into it or actually applying for uh, the ASAP program. It doesn't cost anything to do it. They can put their you know name in and uh, see how things go. Obviously, I don't think they really find out exactly what the rates, if they're accepted and so on and so further down the road, but they might as well put their hat in the ring. Um, I'm assuming you both probably have schools that are doing just that right now. Is that right? So we have we've certainly have schools that, uh, because CSFA is a government right, entity, that there's this comfort level. So, uh, of course, we're putting in applications for them. Uh, our plan is to present all the options not just CSC, not just CSFA, to our clients so that they can evaluate what works best for them. Um, certain things are really important besides cost and rate is the flexibility and so forth. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Similar to Paul there, um, we're recommending all of our clients, um, you know, and helping them go ahead and submit that CSFA ASAP program application. Just there's no cost, there's no obligation, there's nothing binding about it. It's just sort of let's put all of our, you know, options on the table. Um, and one of the things just for the attendees listening, that deadline for their application is Friday, um, this coming Friday, the 23rd of October. And so that's just one thing to put on your radar is, um, you know, and again, it's not binding. There's no cost to apply. It's, you know, just submitting the application and say, hey, we're interested. And I think the CSFA program is going to get back with everyone, I believe, in January or February of 2021. So there is a, you know, a period of time there where they're going to accept all the applications and then, you know, sort out and, and get back to you, like you said, Ryan, with the exact rate, because that's still to be determined. Um, I think it's going to depend on the amount of schools that apply, um, the fund that's available from there, you know, whatever they're drawing their um, program from, and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, and just to clarify too, is you know it's a RAN or trend. These are tax and revenue anticipation notes. Uh, sometimes these are outside of CSFA's option. There's longer term. Sometimes schools could do a RAN for an entire year, but the concept is you're going to get a one lump sum payment. Uh, you know, and you'll have to either sometimes they're redeemed as you know the revenues come in. Other times it's a maturity date on a particular time frame. I think CSFA has a maturity date of January 21 of 22 to for instance you know so you get the money at the end of March or possibly into April sometime around there and then the maturity date of it would be you know um, later down the road in January of 22 so that's another you know option uh, lines of credit uh, we've worked with schools before that have lines of credit in place. Uh, we know other schools, you know, sometimes they've had it, the economy's been good, schools have had healthy cash reserves, sometimes they have it as a backup plan just in case they need it. Um, but it's a, 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 another vehicle, but basically the idea being is they can give you, you know, a capacity, a certain amount as a line of credit, put it into play, and as you need funds, you can draw what you need as you need it typically set up over, you know, one to three year type terms. And, you know, again, there's there's other factors that come into play, I think, here with a line of credit is that, you know, so oftentimes banks might want to require the school to shift all banking relationships and accounts over to that bank, um, you know, but they can be very useful. And, you know, if you can get very competitive rates on uh, lines of credit and that's all the need is, is more of a safety net, that's another option that schools should be looking into as well. Are you finding that uh, many of your schools have lines of credit, Corey, or have you seen, you know, ha have them applying for those right now? Yeah, you know, not not too many of our clients are, are utilizing a line of credit. And, and similar to the term loan, what I've seen is more often than not, it's sort of, you know, used for sort of a one-time project, um, you know, a build out, a tenant improvement, um, or, you know, in the situation of a non you know, non-growth cap here, you know, use it to fund some growth. I, I don't, I haven't seen a ton of my schools use it, um, you know, overall. And then I think, you know, I think it presents an interesting challenge during a deferral period as well, just given that, you know, a line of credit that you draw on it, you know, knowing that you do have to, you know, make payments on it, where if you were to take out the whole lump sum, you know, then that interest is is calculating the entire time that that's out. So I haven't seen it used a ton. And, and when I have seen it, it's been for sort of one-off projects. Yeah. And again, these are all different tools for different schools at different times, depends on what the need is. Um, there's also cash reserves, obviously. Some schools have uh, a lot of cash reserves, and it's a question of, you know, will they use all this, all that cash during this time, or will they, you know, use maybe a portion to finance some, or, you know, a little half and half. Another option I want to show, up, uh, show you guys and also introduce you to it is something that Charter School Capital has put together. So uh, obviously I have a little bit of a biased opinion. I know you guys are gonna present every all the options to the schools and have them analyze it, but what we were looking at is our historical perspective as we served a couple hundred charter schools during the last recession um, and the fact that it went on for several years. When we hit this recession, we really wanted to take into consideration what schools should be concerned with. And so we created this flexible funding line which is basically access to uh, up to about 50% of your uh, annual revenues. So the idea being is that schools might have to tackle deferrals, but there could be also potentially more capacity that they need over and above that, things that were unexpected or ongoing deferrals or budget cuts down the road. So basically you can have access up to about eight months of uh, revenues at one given time to be outstanding. 
Uh, we wanted to give schools security, knowing that their rate or, or cost would not change during that time. So we're providing a locked rate through the uh, end of the fiscal 21 school year. As we get long, you know, past that time or schools want to discuss longer terms, we can certainly do it. But we did want to provide a peace of mind that the schools would have access in a locked rate uh, during that time so they knew the cost wouldn't change. And the other thing we're doing now is because schools are in this tight situation and it's not their fault that COVID occurred or schools shut down, we were trying to provide some kind of relief to the charter schools uh, during this time. So what we're offering in this in this uh, flexible funding line, as we call it, is a uh, no cost for the February deferral. And the reason we're doing that is because that's the longest standing, uh, outstanding uh, receivable. And during that time, since that's going to be pushed out all the way till November, we figured, well, why don't we give the longest outstanding receivable at no cost? So. Uh, just another option, and we can kind of analyze comparisons, but I did want to throw this into the ring as, as an option for schools. So, um, As you look at these financing solutions down the right side, the term loan, the RAN, the TRAN, the lines of credit, flexible funding lines, there's a bunch of factors to consider. And this is what I really want to get across during this. Uh, as we look at these options, there's certain factors to consider. One of them is flexibility. Another is capacity. Another is certainty. And then yet, the one that probably is the biggest or the one that people think of the first is the cost, right? Um, if you, Paul, were to rate these in any specific order, could you put these in any particular order or would you put one above the other or do you find them all to be equal when analyzing you know, different financing solutions? So, of course, you know, we're dealing with taxpayer funds, so cost is always important. Boards are always going to consider cost. I, I think you have to analyze your situation. Um, some programs may be limited to just the deferral period, and that doesn't give you flexibility if 21-22 becomes uh, problematic. Uh, I think, you know, i probably say cost is always going to be a top consideration for everybody, but you really need to analyze what your position is, not just this year the deferral period but try to do a multi-year and understand where we could be headed and, and what that looks like that could change your, your analysis okay corey you have anything to add to that no i mean i, I think um i think i could make the argument that one through four are always you know are are you know the top priority depending on where as sort of paul mentioned where where and what you need the funds for you know i, I think if you go outside the lens of 2021 where you know I know I understand you know a lot of schools are you know capped with you know especially the non-classroom based schools where there's no you know enrollment ADA growth but if you sort of look outside that lens as sort of Paul mentioned to to be on this year um, you know are you when you come to 21 22 are you going to have a lot of growth that you know you're sort of swallowing right now and you know then you know certainty and capacity become more of an issue rather than sort of just cost you know it depends on you know are we gonna are you gonna turn around on july 1st of 2021 and say have 15 percent 20 percent more students because of you know the nature of what's gone on the last 18 months i think one of the things to to just sort of consider is when we hopefully start you know next july taking attendance um a lot of these schools if you really think about it, we're gonna have close to 16 months straight months of not claiming any attendance and so you know i think the you know the three of us and i think the individuals in this webinar understand how quickly the charter landscape can can change from school to school as far as just you know growth or you know decline as far as like what does your school really look like um you know heading into 21 22 and 22 23 as far as you know what you're getting paid off of today is it going to grow is it going to is it going to shrink and and that really plays a big role i mean i think you know the the certainty of the next six months with the deferrals, I think, is is absolutely a priority. I think, you know, obviously Paul makes a good point on the cost, but you know, what's your capacity look like, you know, the next 18 months? And so I think that's, you know, depending on where you are in your charter life cycle and you know your enrollment, you know, fluctuation against this cap, um, you know, is is a key factor to think about. Yeah. Yeah, all good points. I mean, and like you said, again, it goes back to the whole, you know, what does the school actually need the money for and so on. I mean, if if it's a, 
if it's a build out on a, on a building that has to be done within a particular time uh, time frame, there's probably more focus around certainty and making sure because there's a time cost of money there as well. And, uh, you know, kind of missed opportunity costs if they can't build out quick enough. And then other schools are just looking for cash flow financing. So all good points. Um, I'd like to take a look at, you know, when we look at these in terms of flexibility, you know, with the uncertainty we spoke about with COVID, with the idea that we don't know what's happening in 22. As you analyze, Paul, for a term loan, a RAN, a TRAN, a line of credit, um, can you kind of just touch on where you think there's flexibility in each and how it pertains to each of these? So typically, Ed, some of these are, are the, the RAN or TRAN, you're, you're talking about they're dealing with specific revenue streams and CSFA is dealing with that specific deferral period. Um, line of credit is what I find most of them are very, very limited in flexibility, right? So uh, term loans, again, same thing. Uh, the flexible funding line sounds to me like it would be something I would want to make sure I present to my clients along with the cost associated with that. Uh, to prepare them for, to have the ability to deal with unknowns, right? Uncertainty is the greatest fear in finance, um, and that's what we're dealing with now. So to yeah. me, I think flexibility is very important. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the idea behind the flexible funding line, just so you know, too, is that it's providing capacity up to a max amount on a borrowing, like we said, up to about 50% of your annual revenues but it doesn't commit you to using it. So the idea being is it's there should you need it, but you only pay for what you need when you need it. If you don't need any of it, never have to pay on anything. But if uh, you have the peace of mind that it is there as a backup, uh, should you need to access more capital. Um, Corey, capacity to you. Uh, as you look at the term loans, RANs, TRANs, lines of credit, uh, what do you feel, You know, how does it pertain from a capacity standpoint to each of those? Yeah, I mean, I think, um sort of just to go back to what Paul touched on there with the flexibility on the on the the RAN you know really because the line of credit and the term loan um in the sense of a charter school is not really gonna be tied um you know as much as they'll look at your financials it's not really tied to sort of that revenue that you you know primarily as from a charter school derived from state ADA which that RAN or TRAN sort of touches on that um and then with you know going back to that so that's going to be kind of fixed on that so with the capacity um two things I wanted to sort of mention um as far as scope is just sort of that the the growth that I talked about, where if, if you know a lot of the non-classroom based schools I work with have, um, you know, we're fixed at at you know X today, but I think when they come out of it into 21, 22 and beyond, they're going to be at a, you know a number significantly greater than X, and so um, you know the ability to work with CSFA on what will be sort of a fixed income, if you will, to hey look we're up 20 percent, what can you guys do for that? And I think another capacity thing um, that I know. You're just, at least I, I understand CSFA hasn't touched upon is, and this is the concern too, is, you know, when, when they are, when the state says we're going to pay back these deferrals, you know, beginning July, August, September, October, November, you know, the underlying assumption there is that you're going to get your deferral plus your regular, you know, August, 2021 state aid. And I think a point to be made there is, as we've sort of touched upon with these deferrals, if you think the state's going to be able to eight months from now, double pay everyone for six or eight months um i don't think that's going to happen and i don't i don't want to um you know look too much into the glass ball but if, if you think the state's going to be able to say hey look we had to give you guys you know an iou for six or eight months now we can pay back that iou plus your regular amount um i think that's something as far as a capacity standpoint to say go back to that csfa ran or tran program go back to some of those term loans um hey look you know my situation's now changed significantly um, I think that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. Yeah, yeah, great points. And we don't know if there's more budget cuts or deferrals or both, you know, coming down the line. So yeah, once you kind of get a certain amount, you want to make sure you have access to more. So um, from a certainty standpoint, Paul, kind of back to you, um, as it applies to each of these, you know, obviously there's certainty in some facets that, you know, our fixed rates are probably better than floating rates and longer term agreements are sometimes better. And, you know, getting the funds at one lump sum might be more appealing. Um, but the uncertainty part of it is obviously, I think is, is, uh, Corey just touched on is that, you know, once what happens if, you know, what if I need more? What if I, you know, will you be there for me? Or I do know during the last recession, I don't know if it's going to occur this time, but oftentimes with the lines of credit banks, 
you know, pulled back or did not renew lines of credit or got a little eerie on, on expanding on those lines of credit. Um, what do you feel when you look at these down the right side for a certainty perspective? So the first thing that comes to mind is covenants. Okay, so uh, in uncertain times is where your financials can suffer. Uh, meeting covenants is really important. You don't want a loan called when you're at, at at the point of the inability to to, to deal with it being called. Um, that that is a recipe for for troubled times. So. Um, certainly you want to look at what covenants are attached to any monies that you're taking. Um, and I agree, I'm going to step back to Corey's point before about the state double paying, right? That's a really good issue. Um, I always call these deferrals versus the cuts. I call it a wink and a nod. They, they tell everyone we're going to fully pay you, but no, we're not. We, so we're fully funding education, but we can't really cut you the check yet, right? So right. schools have these limited options. So it's important to, to make sure you understand what your outlook is long term so as you evaluate several different options. Yeah, all good points. Um, when I look at, I think the fourth one obviously is the one that I think everybody hears, you know, first off, you, I know in my experience, a lot of people right away, typically when speaking with uh, potential clients or existing clients is what, what's the rate? And that's what, you know, the first order of business. First question, what's the rate? Um, I guess, you know, what we really want to point out here is that, you, you know, you can't just look at rate, right? any of these solutions, you have to take into consideration the overall total cost. So there's different components to that. There's interest rates, which can be annualized terms or a discount that you know applies to the borrowed funds. But then there's a structure. You know, How are the funds delivered? When are they released? What's the maturity date? How long are they outstanding that you have to calculate the actual term as well when it even comes into the rate and what impact that has on it? Um, and then, of course, fees. A lot of the times, um, I just I know when you know I did a, a a mortgage recently you know in closing on a house is uh, you know there's a lot of other fees that go into just what my mortgage rate was uh, you know there's closing costs there's uh, fees to realtors and lenders and everything else that go into it so so it does apply to different you know term loans rands trans lines of credit is that there's you know issuance fees transaction fees underwriting fees legal fees i know with the asap program one of the things that did come up on the on the uh, webinar that was referenced and i don't know if many people caught it but you know borrowers council uh fees things that are just added costs that you may have to to get these uh, financing in place and then, you know, lines of credit may have annual fees. Uh, sometimes you only pay for what you uh, actually draw on that line of credit. Other times they'll charge an annual fee. Not only will it have an origination fee, but an annual fee on top of it. And uh, whether you use or don't use that money. So as you look at cost, uh, you know, the flexible funding line, just to reiterate, is you only pay for what you need when you need it. And so as you draw just a time cost of money from the time the money's issued to the time that that uh, revenue would be redeemed from the state is the only, only, only payment with no other fees. But how do you look at you know, overall costs as you start to analyze these different options? And I'll shoot that out to Corey since Paul spoke last. Uh, sure, you know, I mean, and, and cost is, as Paul said from the onset, I think on this slide, you know, it, it's not lost on on myself that this is taxpayer dollars and and you know not to to be actually you know be diligent with you know evaluating any option and I think there's a lot of things Ryan that you touched on really just the structure the the interest rate but I think one of the things and not to get too much into a, a time value of money you know sort of analysis here but you know just sort of simply put you know if I want a dollar today it's going to cost me a lot more than if I want a dollar a month from now and so just sort of the timing I think Ryan you really touched on when when you get the funds and how much you get, um, you know, my understanding, just to go back to that, the, the TRAN ran with the CSFA ASAP program is you're going to get, you know, for better or for worse, the school is going to get all of their deferrals in one big lump sum. And, you know, from a cash and bank standpoint, that sounds great. You know, hey, I just got a big chunk of funds. I can probably sleep pretty easy for the next five, five or six months, if you will. But, you know, one of the things to keep in mind on that is, you know, as soon as I get that money in my bank account, um, you know, I'm paying interest, you know, factored into that, you know, all the way out until I think that last deferral gets paid back as scheduled now in, in November. And so it's one of those things to 
am I much better off getting that say in, you know, over a period of time when I really need it, you know, do I want $5 today or a dollar every month for the next five months? Well, that $5 today, cause it's more valuable is going to cost me more. And so I think, um, you know, that's just one thing to, to keep in mind where sort of the, the opportunity cost of getting your money today in a big lump sum versus sort of, you know, periodically over time, um, is something that, that, you know, has to be taken into account. Right. Well, what I'll do is uh, let's just take a look at, you know, for an example, right? Um, and this is just that. This is just an example of, you know, an interest rate structure and fees and how it all plays into the role of the overall cost. And, you know, you should find out uh, your pricing and finance amount from these options and evaluate all of this as you look at your different options. And you can ask, we, we'd be happy to do it. We run cost analysis for different clients all the time to different options out there, as well as your BOPs. Obviously, they're very well versed in this and can help and assist you as you analyze the cost. Again, as you look at a comparative analysis, this is just one example. Keep in mind, please, that you know all of these numbers in here, the upfront fees, the interest rates, the release of the funds, the terms, all could be changed. And this is uh, just one specific example, but you could easily replug all different types of numbers and run the same cost analysis in this type of format. But make sure you are taking into consideration the interest rate, the structure, the fees, all of it um, as you analyze. So the reason we chose this, guys, and the reason I, I put this into the slide is the one and a half million dollars. I know there's a lot of schools that will never need a million and a half dollars. Some could need, you know, as little as a couple hundred thousand dollars. Some larger CMOs might need significantly more than one and a half million dollars. It was just kind of a plug number in the middle of the road. And we tried to run it from a line of credit. Um, you know, the RAN or TRAN, again, obviously we're re referencing the ASAP only because I think a lot of schools are looking at it and what we were using for their numbers were strictly what came out of the webinar. I don't know if things have changed and what the rates will be, but we were trying to be uh, conservative with our numbers. I know they had rates from one to 5% on issuance fees and one and a half to three and a half on the interest rates. So we were trying to be conservative with those numbers. Um, maturity dates of you know uh, nine months which is the January of 22 and when the issue dates come out lines of credit same thing let's just do it on a 12 month term and assume a school sets it up now and is able to draw on those funds as time goes on and term loans uh, same thing so as we run through these numbers you know this was just kind of an analysis so you know with this um, what would you say you know as you kind of look through this what are your general thoughts and i'll put this back to paul when you look at a at a screen like this what, what are your thoughts so it, it it does remind me that you know there's a lot of factors to consider and uh, this is where your board can be helpful too a lot of times you might have a lawyer or a banker uh, anybody who says you said ryan i recently purchased a house too and to read through your closing documents uh, it's like you need a law degree and there are fees and all types of things hidden in these um, so oftentimes you might have a board member who, who can help you understand what you're getting into uh, it's important to to look at all those factors and make sure you understand what you're going to be on the hook for um, and again uh, at the end of the day you know somebody breaking it down for you to provide total out the door cost for you so you can understand that as one component and do uh, oftentimes we'll create a grid just like this and just line them up and say you know is this a flexible program or are you are you committed to a specific period here and what is your out the door cost so uh, so that they can make a decision yeah Corey, do you have any other kind of views on that as well yeah um yeah i was at, i actually want to i'm just going to kind of focus on the the release of funds you know sort of row there and really just sort of touching on what i said on that on that previous slide is it's really just sort of a timing thing as far as if you look at the two sort of line of credit and the flexible funding line which they are the two cheapest compared to the ran or tran and it's really just a matter of the you know the execution the timing of when you get all those funds as far as you know basically just contrasting five monthly releases um versus a full installment and so for example and just if i were to take all of my money out on the line of credit on 331 well, my total estimated cost is going to go up significantly because I'm now paying interest on that full balance. And similarly, um, on that flexible funding line, Ryan, like if I were to say, hey, hey, CSE, can you fund me all of my money 
instead of doing these monthly releases, well, that cost is going to go up, you know, as well. And so really, I think the, the point I just wanted to make here was just sort of the release of funds and a timing on, you know, do I want it all today or do I want monthly installments? And that's really going to affect, you know, the amount of interest you really pay, you know, as much as, um, you know, I think look at everything, the, the upfront fees, the rates, um, you know, all that plays a factor. But I think one of the biggest things is just the timing and how much you get and when, you know, I think might be the, the biggest driving factor there as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point too. And and I'm glad you pointed that out with the flexible funding line, that release was designed uh, as opposed to taking a big lump sum when you may or may not need it. Um, you know, if you're not doing a tenant improvement build out, you are already projected to, you know, receive your funds uh, as they would have come in typically. So the design of that pro program was just to release the funds normally as they would have come in, therefore saving you uh, money for not having that outstanding balance. And then obviously, of course, because the February payment, which is the longest outstanding in that case scenario, if that's at no cost, that's a significant savings on, uh, you know, on the total cost there. But yeah, I mean, like a line of credit could actually, we don't know if it's a 1% fee up front. We might find a line of credit that just has a flat $500 setup fee. Uh, you might have an interest rate of 3% or 4%. And if you can get those lines of credit, that is great. Um, you know, they ran trans, it could be lower for higher dollar amounts. Uh, so you'd have to run this cost analysis at higher dollar amounts to see if those upfront fees are lower. Um, and we won't know, you know, until the end uh, what those rates will be, but they could be significantly lower. Same thing with the term loan, that that rate is a lower rate or a higher rate. Um, our 699 rate, that's just kind of an average. And that's just an average out there. And you keep in mind is that each school is different. And as we mentioned before, there's different stages of growth. There's brand new schools versus uh, schools that have been renewed multiple times. There's schools of 100 kids, there's schools of 1,000 kids. Um, those rates are dependent on the school's maturity and overall population, and as well as the uh, you know amount of course of the that is needed. Um, but that's about an average number. You know, it could be lower, it could be higher, and that's on a school by school basis. But again, as you go through this as a school, as a leader out there, just take the time to make sure that you look at all your options and look at all of the factors that come into play on it. So I'll leave it at that. Do either of you have any, anything else you want to add on the screen before I s switch? No. Okay. So this was just a comp comparison matrix. Uh, I don't want to read through all of this, um, but you, the slides, just so everybody knows the slides, the content will all be here. We'll be able to email it out also with the, uh, the actual recorded session. Um, but as you look through, are there any things that kind of jump off the page as we, before we kind of head into the question session, uh, as you analyze kind of this type of matrix across the board with different options? I'll put this to you, Paul, first. So again, you know, uh, I think a key consideration, Corey made a great point about you, you, your flexibility is important because once you take money, you're on the you're paying interest on it. So flexibility on, on when you're funded uh, and when you can pull funding, uh, that kind of flexibility can help you manage those costs um, and use just the money you need at that point in time. It's, it's I think this is a great presentation and uh, I would encourage clients or we would prepare hopefully for clients these types of matrix so that they can make a good decision. Uh, they can understand all what they're getting into and what's important to look at. Yeah, Corey, you have anything to add on here as you look at this? No, I, I think really just um, circling back to something Paul's you know, made a point of a couple of times, just really just consider all your options. You know, I think as we mentioned with a lot of our clients, um, if not all of them, we're going to submit our, our ASAP application for the RAND TRAN program to see what that comes back. And, and, you know, a lot of the stuff we're encouraging is, you know, talk to your banks as far as, you know, once you've had a relationship on line of credit, on term loans, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the things um, for those who have bought houses or refinanced, um, you know, interest rates are, are 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 very low right now, and so maybe something that wasn't, you know, fiscally prudent, you know, two years ago, even eight months ago, with a line of credit at, at your local bank, um, you know, maybe that makes sense now. And so it's just it's really just having, you know, a a breadth of of options, and really at that point, as as Paul touched upon, what do you need the money for? How quickly do you need it? Um, I think it's, it's all it's all variable and, and every sort of school is going to be unique just, you know, based on, you know, their current situation. 
Yeah, I think it's all good advice. Um, I want to move to obviously the questions here. Just uh, we had a couple kind of questions. Um, was which option is best for a small school, 200, 200 student school? Do you guys have an opinion on smaller schools versus larger school options, or do you just think it applies to kind of what what they're trying to solve for? I think it's again, it's you know everybody has particular factors they need to consider, right? Uh, small school, large school. Do you have reserves? Are you going to use reserves? Um, covenants, uh, flexibility, cost. Smaller schools might be more cost sensitive. Uh, they don't typically don't have you know. I find some schools have enrollment that hits a sweet spot where they they have a nice margin and they're able to to build a reserve. Uh, if you're not there yet, uh, cost can be really important. Um, if your margins are slimmer, um, flexibility is important. So I, I think you really have to consult with somebody and have, uh, whether it's your board or a back office or you have in-house uh, CBO who, who can help you understand your needs. And having a cash flow projection is important as well. And going into the next year using some basic assumptions that either SSC or somebody is putting out there so that you're taking something that legislative analysts have put together how they feel the state's going to look in the coming years. Yeah, Corey, do you have uh, any other insight on that? Uh, no, I mean, I, I agree first and foremost with everything sort of Paul said, you know, each school is going to be unique just depending on their structure, you know, how, you know, just how they're built really, to be honest. Um, but one of the things, you know, to keep in mind too is, um, you know, sort of those upfront fees when you're taking out a, say, a smaller loan, you know, it's a school of 200 compared to a school of 2000. Um, those upfront fees as a percentage of what you're actually borrowing usually, you know, are going to be higher on a smaller loan where if I'm taking out, you know, a $10 million loan, you know, that percentage of the loan that is fees is a lot smaller than on, say, a loan that maybe is a 200 charter, a 200 student, excuse me, charter school may need. And so that's one of the things as we sort of touched upon to look at everything, but those upfront fees usually sort of weigh a greater percentage on a smaller amount of money. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, particularly even when you get into facilities and I know a lot of the uh, the bond issuances out there for facility structures typically don't like to go below $10 million because of just that, you know, the factors that include up the upfront fees. So um, right. just out of curiosity, uh, there was another question regarding um, non-classroom based learning schools. Was Is there any option that is better suited for non-classroom based versus site based schools? Corey, I'll go, let you go first on this one if you have any options, or is it just the same answer as the small school ones? No, it, it's similar. I mean, if you look, if you think about a non-classroom-based school, it kind of depends on, you know, really what are your fixed costs in the sense, you know, and this, I know this isn't directly answering the question, but, you know, if you're a non-classroom-based virtual school, you, you know, in theory, maybe don't have the same facility costs, the same, you know, sort of fixed costs, if you will, um, compared to a site-based school. Um, but really, it just it, it goes back to, you know, a lot of these non-classroom based schools, um, at least the, a lot of the ones that we work with here, um, they're they're experiencing growth. And so, you know, in a cap year, how do you manage that? And it's, you know, sort of weighing on, you know, this year, you're pretty much on fixed income. And so how do you want to come out of, you know, when you show up on, you know, next fall? And I, I know that's a it seems like it's a long way off, but really sort of strategically planning to position yourself in a in a situation to capitalize on that growth and be able to fund it because you know you know ryan i think we've worked before um on situations and even in an ada growth year you know how do you manage july through january before that p1 gets in um and this year it's really like how do i manage a july to june plus then another july to january of growth um you know again i, I don't know if this is specific to non-classroom based i went kind of went off um off the road a little bit there but i think it, it's all factors to be considered yeah Paul, you have anything, any thoughts on non-classroom based comparatively before we go? Uh, it's what I've been saying is that every school just needs to understand their needs and they can be unique needs. Uh, it might not just be that you're non-classroom based versus classroom based. It's where are you in your life? Uh, what are your reserves? What, uh, you know, is there growth happening? Uh, your fixed costs, you know, you have facilities, are there covenants? I think all of those factors, all schools just need to break down and understand uh, what suits them best given their outlook and their budget. Yeah. 
And I think that summarizes this whole presentation. I appreciate it is that, you know, just do that. Look at all your options. Look at exactly what it is you're trying to solve for. You're all got to look through your individual lenses as school leaders out there. Find out and compare all the factors that come into play and just know the true cost at the end of the day and make the best decision for your schools. Um, the only other question, I'm, I'll take this one off of line, which is how do we learn more about the flexible funding line? Um, first off, I want to say that here's Paul Corey's email, Corey Cavanaugh's email. Should you have any questions for either of these two very reputable BOPs? And they do great, great work out there. I've appreciated working with them in the past. Uh, we work with all the BOPs just like they work with all the different financial institutions out there. Um, you know, should you have any questions for them, feel free to reach out there. Again, this content will be uh, provided after um, the webinar closes here. And then the last one was how do we find out more information about the flexible funding line? Uh, again, you can feel free to reach out to me, Ryan Eldridge at uh, charterschoolcapital.org or grow charters at capital school, uh, charterschoolcapital.org. And you know the information is here. This is you know kind of what we're what we're doing. But uh, Paul and Corey, I really appreciate your time today. I think this was pretty valuable. Hopefully for those in attendance, um, you know I hope everybody is safe and well out there. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. And uh, we wish you the best of luck as you uh, handle all the uncertainty that's in front of you. Thank you for letting me participate. I enjoyed this. Absolutely. Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity of, uh, of talking, and, and Paul, it's great to be alongside you as well. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. Have a great day. Uh, everybody out there, be safe and well. Thank you for joining, and uh, take care. Thank you.